And the only thing I want to add to this is specific heat. Usually you call it specific heat, sometimes you call it specific heat capacity because you want to uh, be really specific, really careful. I shouldn't say specific. You want to be really careful about what you mean. <laughs> specific heat capacity is when you take the heat capacity and you divide by how much stuff you have. For instance, total number of modes. Well, depends on the total number of molecules. And then the, it depends on the number of modes each molecule has. So delta E thermal depends on how much stuff you have. Total number of molecules. You could write the total number of molecules. You could measure how much stuff you have in terms of number of atoms or molecules or in terms of moles or in terms of the mass. One mole of the stuff weighs a certain amount. <coughs> so this total number of molecules, if, if every molecule has whatever we had here for steam, what did we have? Um, 12, 15. We had 15 modes for every water molecule. If there's n water molecules, then there's 15 n modes total in that gas of n water molecules. So heat capacities always depend on how much stuff you have. If you have a little bit extra, the heat capacity is a little bit bigger. If you have a lot more, the heat capacity is a lot bigger. And so specific heats are defined where you divide out that result. Where something that doesn't depend on n. Warren has a struggle with this. I thought CH4 at 15 and water had none. Could you make that again? That water has what? I thought CH4 was at 15 because there was five times. Or can you go to where water is at 10? Okay, so, so water has, maybe I said the wrong number. Water has three molecule, three atoms in the molecule, right? So, it, and each atom lives in a three-dimensional world. So there's got to be nine kinetic energies, and I said it wrong, it's not 15, it's 12. It's nine kinetic energies, three of those kinetic energies are vibration, so there's three potential energies, so nine and three is 12. So water is 12, sorry about that. Water has, every molecule of water floating around has 12 modes. 12 ways of having energy. Three kinetic energy vibration, three potential energy vibration, different kinds of ways it can vibrate, three ways it can fly around in a three-dimensional world, and three ways that it can rotate. N of those water molecules has 12 times N, total number of modes. Every single mode gets the same amount of energy. So changes in thermal energy depend on changes in temperature, and that means If no work is done, I'm going to make that the zero, call this delta E thermal over delta T. Write in that delta E thermal. Number of modes per molecule times one half times Kb. There's a delta T, but I divided the delta T out, so that's gone. If I then took C and divided by the number of, mo of molecules, then I would have the specific heat per molecule. If I turned number of molecules into, I'm not sure, what do you use for moles? N or nu or, I'll use N.
I can take N as capital N, the number of atoms as the number of moles times Avogadro's number and stick that in here. Then this is little n number of moles times Avogadro's number and if I divide, if I want to find the molar specific heat I would down here, the molar specific heat is the heat capacity divided by the number of moles so the molar specific heat I would divide by this little n if I take this, divide by little n, which is sitting there, I'm left with capital NA, Avogadro's number, times the number of moles per, modes per molecule, <coughs> times one half kb. There's a one half, a kb, Avogadro's number, number of modes, per molecule and that's the molar specific heat. So that's something you can estimate by yourself right now for various things. So I just want you to think about this. Helium gas, well you can look up the mass specific heat. It's 3.1 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So you can look that up, you can do a lot of calculations, but I think that you can tell me the molar specific heat of helium gas in joules per mole Kelvin, that would be the molar specific heat, that's the units of molar specific heat. Um, If I tell you well, no, molar specific heat divided by R. That's what I'd like you. So what is R? R is a gas constant, which you know and love. In fact, it's exactly that. R is is Boltzmann's constant times Avogadro's number. That's what the gas constant is. They're the same number. So this is just one half R times the number of modes per molecule. That's the molar specific heat. What if I divide that by R? If I divide the molar specific heat by R, then I just have one half times the number of modes per molecule. Well, helium gas, helium is monatomic, so a molecule is just an atom. How many modes does that helium atom have? Three. So, the molar specific heat per R, that's three. I divide it out by R. What happens when I divide three by two? I get one and a half. The molar specific heat divided by R for helium gas, neon gas, argon gas, xenon gas, all the same number. Yeah. Um, you're using R as two something. I'm using R as Boltzmann's constant times Na, and it's what is it? It's like 8.3 or something joules per. I can't remember what R is. 3.1 <laughs> by 8 whatever. Oh, yeah, mass okay. yeah, this is mass specific heat. The, the weird thing about mass specific heat is it depends on how many protons and neutrons are in the nucleus and that could be anything. You know, for helium gas, there's, there's two protons and two neutrons. So it's light. For xenon, I don't know. How about argon? Argon, I think, I don't know why I think of argon as 40. We don't have a, I don't know if, now I don't know if 40 is the atomic number or the atomic mass. So I didn't look this up, clearly. Um, argon is a lot heavier than helium. Oh, there you go. Helium gas is four mass, because it has two neutrons and two protons. What do you think the mass of argon gas is? Why did I think of 40? Because that's the atomic mass. The number of neutrons plus protons is 40. 
which is why this you get 0.31 for this. It's not like they're really special. It's just if you divide it by mass, you've divided by really different numbers. But the same number of modes. Same number of ways of putting energy in. Solid, any of these simple things, I just picked the simple ones. Complicated ones like ice, uh, they have a lot of different, they're, they're more complicated, they have a lot more modes to try to figure out. The simple ones like sodium and iron and stuff, you end up with three for the molar specific heat divided by R. So if you end up with three, then how many modes per atom did you per per atom did you have? Six. What are those modes? How would you name them? One atom has six modes. How would you name them in terms of the types of energy they are? Three kinetic energies, and since the atom is just vibrating back and forth, it's trapped in a solid. There's three potential energies, one for each of the vibration. Six total modes for the solid. Six divided by two is three. All of these have number have the molar specific heat equal to three times R, basically. And the molar specific heat of these gases is 1.5 times R. Because you bound the atoms in a solid into a solid, there are suddenly a bunch of potential energies that need energy also. It's not just the kinetic energy. So higher molar specific heat. Yeah. So your molar specific heat is always just half of the amount of modes. The molar specific heat is half of the number of modes per atom or per molecule times R. Times the gas constant R. I mean you all know the gas constant and you all know one half. So if you can calculate the number of modes per atom or per molecule, whatever it is you've assembled, um, then you can figure out the molar specific heat of anything. And you can also back that out. You can look up the heat capacity of something, figure out its molar specific heat, divide by one half, divide by R, and you end up with a number of modes that are, that are active. As it was pointed out, some modes at low temperatures can be frozen out and just not there anymore. And the ones that don't, that are, are not there, the first ones to disappear as the temperature goes down are the vibrational modes. And sometimes you lose some vibrational modes but not others. Or actually you don't, <coughs> You don't lose any of them quickly, I guess is the key. What happens is as it cools down, modes become less and less active. So that as the temperature changes, you're kind of losing modes continuously. Yeah. But they're kind of quantized, right? You're saying so if you add, you suddenly gain slowly <laughs> Well, energy is quantized. That's right. So there are energy levels. <laughs> If you're at very low temperatures, so the atoms are just moving around really slowly and, and you have a diatomic molecule, then some atom comes up here like this because it's really low temperature and it does that. And because it, does, it can't transfer very much energy because it doesn't have very much, it can't jump that up a level. <coughs> but what if you're at a higher temperature? Well, then it comes along faster. Maybe one comes along, hits it, still can't jump it up a level. But these are all moving around randomly. So at the same temperature, there's going to be some that are moving fast. And those can come in and jump it up a level. So what happens is that at any temperature, the fastest moving, moving atoms will still be able to make this oscillate. But there aren't very many of them. And as you raise the temperature, you get more and more of those fast ones. So more often this gets to, starts oscillating. When you get to a high enough temperature, there's enough of them around that it's always oscillating. So it's a slow process as the temperature goes up that you start getting your uh, diatomic molecules oscillating. 
it, it isn't a fast process. The reason it isn't fast is because not all the atoms move at exactly the same speed. There's always a variation of speeds. There's always some that are fast enough to cause something to oscillate, even at low temperatures. There just aren't very many of them. Any other questions? So I have some questions for you. We'll start easy and get harder. Maybe. You already knew that the heat capacity tells us how e-thermal changes when the temperature changes. Now you know that heat capacity per atom is exactly the same for a whole bunch of solid elements. Solid sodium, solid iron, solid what, what tungsten. Each of those have three modes, sorry, six modes per atom. Three are kinetic, three are potential. These are solid so their atoms are bonded. They have both kinetic energy and potential energy modes. This tells us that for two of these solids sitting on top of each other at the same temperature. So I take a chunk of sodium and I sit it on top of a chunk of iron. Sodium is light, a light atom. Iron's a heavier, even heavier. Let's put a chunk of tungsten on top of a chunk, sorry, a, a chunk of sodium on top of a chunk of tungsten. So tungsten, really heavy atoms. Sodium, pretty light atoms. When these two are on top of each other, so at their same temperature, what does that tell you? What can you conclude? More kinetic energy, lighter atoms have more kinetic energy, less kinetic energy, moving faster, moving slower, or none of the above. Yeah. 